<laughs> oh god i'm so glad to see you guys sorry it was a little bit of a, a late start this morning how are you all doing it's been a weird week i've had a weird week it's been definitely my most isolated kind of paranoid week where i feel like i'm spinning my wheels on the things i'm working on and uh yeah it's been it's been the weirdest week i've had so far i have to say it's been i've been more like crazy feeling than i have been um mm. which i don't love <laughs> mm. i i relate um, to that entirely because i think it was about two two weeks ago for me i just had a funk where for a couple of weeks i couldn't i just couldn't get in the groove of anything i was doing the days just went on endlessly and i realized that even though I'd often worked from home anyway, that I used errands and meeting up with people and various other things yeah. to structure my time. And when I was stuck at home with no other excuses, it, it, I couldn't structure my time as well. It took me a, a couple of weeks to sort it out. Yeah, yeah, I've been working, but it's like it's like the the judge, the critical voice in my head has been very loud this week, um, and I'm not sure why, mm. but it has been. Um, so there it is. Mm -hmm. um, but things are opening up here, and I have to go at nine right on the nose because I'm actually going to a spin class, which oh. a public and like an actual hey. spin class. So, so you can spin in person. But, so you can so you can spin your wheels yeah. in person instead of at home. Exactly. Like it's much better that way. Like it's literal as opposed to metaphorical, which is way better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and you and you, Toby, have you been having? Uh, protests and things near your oh, house? No, no, I've been, been honing my procrastination skills to a very fine point. I think as a writer, that's, that's really it. important because you have to be able no, to I'm say, I'm going to deliver the next, in the next one or two weeks. Yeah. And I will fight anyone who says they're better than me. What is, their, what is your best procrastination um, method? You mean other than masturbation? Yes. Um, it's, well, uh, masturbation is essential. Um, that's not procrastination. That's just getting by. <laughs> it's a survival tool yes <laughs> exactly. um no it's it's the it's the 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 boundless endless joy of the internet and <laughs> the foulness therein that you can you know all the little strange eddies that you're carried on by into these weird tidal regions where rules and regulations and and people are not as you thought they were and as you say, weird conspiracies and weird ideas and frogs that you can lick to get hallucinogenic things that release the God molecule. <laughs> There's just wonderful stuff there. Gosh, so this is probably your most profound sponge period where you're just soaking up all this internet goodness. Soaking and, and, and your brain is filtering. There's nowhere for it to go. Well, you know, we could always start yeah. a Twitch channel. Maybe we should do that because it seems oh, that... There's lots of people uh, sort of taking you into their homes as a big brother at home um, or reading, reading the internet, you know, together with thousands of faceless people. We could, uh, we could try that. And yeah. See if that makes us you're, feel any better. You're right. Yes. <laughs> Let's be influencers. <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm just, I'm a dinosaur. Like I just, I just, I just can't. Like I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel so crazy. I can't. Well, I don't know I what what your. I mean, have your have your kids embraced the internet though, Marcus? I mean, do they know about this stuff? Do they, or have you successfully kept them free of that? Or as free well, as they I mean, be? embrace. I mean, the internet is part of our the air we breathe, but sure. uh, I, they're not. Neither is uh, particularly. Um, I mean, I guess Zach, my twenty five year old, who's quite intense and cerebral. Uh, he, and spends a lot of time alone. Um, um, it, it, he does a lot of r kind of reading and watching, and like he's he did his degree in philosophy, and so I, I guess in that way, um, right. but not in the kind of uh, social way. I don't think. Sure. Well, I I that find it I find the new world a bit challenging because I just I have developed over time a creative method that involves bouncing ideas off of other people. And that really f is facilitated best when they're in the room or on a call like this, where at least we can have low latency conversation. But when I'm thrown into, let's say a social media environment where there's long lag or it's asynchronous or something like that, it, it, it doesn't help me out at all. I find that I just can't, I can't move forward. So, uh, and, and indeed some of these things where you are talking 
to yourself, and then maybe five minutes later, you see something uh, come up on a chat stream that you can respond to. My brain just hasn't been able to cope with that. Uh, it was designed in a different era, I suppose, um, where people met up in person a lot. And so that's going to be challenged. I'm going to have to grow a whole new brain for this new environment. My yeah, quick fire walking in wit <laughs> lag. <laughs> you just demonstrated the lag. Sorry. Go, yeah. Toby. What'd right? you say? No. My quick fire wildy and wit doesn't work with lag. I know. My wit's best my wit's best in person too. <laughs> exactly. It's a horrible thing where you suddenly go do it. Wait, do I do, 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 no someone no? When do I Exactly. Well, no, yeah. we'll totally have to do it. We have to count down three, mm -hmm. two, one in our heads and speak after someone says something. So mm. Okay, and on to the next thing. So let's go to the tabletop since we're pressed for time and we've got us all together okay. here. Um, I just just to kind of keep things fluid and, and hopefully interesting, I, I've been buying storytelling games, card games of various kinds and looking at them. This is one that I played around with yesterday called Storymatic. It's very simple. It has a bunch of gold colored cards that you use to create characters and a bunch of copper cards to sort of create um, conflicts or, or jumping off points. For stories, it has a few games in it. It seems very, very simple, very it's basic. Like a, it's, this is like a party game? I don't think so. I think it was designed by, I didn't read all the instructions. I think it was designed by an educator, um, perhaps. Oh, okay. And like uh, an educational thing. Okay. It was sort of a, it was a way to get um, people to, uh, to, to be creative storytelling wise. And, and there's a bunch of exercises. I can't call them games, really. They're more like exercises. And well, let's start with the very simplest one, which is really that it says here that you draw two gold cards and together you combine them to make one character. And then once you have established your character, you draw two copper cards uh, to come up with a story. Now that's ex exceedingly straightforward, um, but I think the idea is to kind of keep it moving. You can keep, keep doing them multiple times. You know, if, the, if they're not working so well, move on and do another. So. Let's let's try it. Let's just grab two cards here and see what happens. I'll grab that one from there and this one from here. And what do we have? We have um, we have a person who is new to the area. I know it's a little hard to see. This color is not very helpful, but it's a a person who is new to the area. Okay. And we have. Um, Cheapskate. <laughs> cheapskate. All right. Okay. A person who is new to the area <laughs> and a cheapskate. <clears throat> so let's see if we can think of a character here. What do we think of that? I think of an alien, actually. When I think of a person new to the area, I don't know. For some reason, I think of an alien who's uh, who's arrived. But it could I never I never thought about it, aliens. I never thought about aliens arriving. Um, and being and being like you know seeking to cut costs all the time. <laughs> that could be a new kind of That's alien, sort of a basically fun idea. the frugal, the frugal mm. alien who who thinks that somehow Earth is going to be a better place for them to to save their their Bitcoin. Yeah, or who's like trying to? I mean, who's trying to uh, to whatever take over like invade or take over the the world in classic alien movie style but is like trying to do it on the cheap like is, is looking for ways to kind of cut corners and like that's a good one actually that's really good and so there's always cost cutting it's like release the kraken yeah. no no we can't release the kraken that that cost no, too much let's, just let's, the the kraken. Kraken. <laughs> okay. yeah i'm gonna go talk to them i can see if i'm gonna tell them we have a kraken <laughs> So uh, yeah, so it's a uh, Earth. So we can call this sort of Earth invasion um, on the cheap. I don't on know. the cheap, so, yeah, yeah. So this is the yeah the, the cheapskate alien invasion. That's quite funny. Um, I, what is what is the expression? I, maybe this is totally wrong, but I was just thinking: is it like short arms, deep pockets, or something? With somebody who who or it's sort of like a another version of. Penny wise, pound foolish, or something, or no, it's slightly different. But I just think of somebody who has deep pockets, been short arms. 
aliens might have very short arms. They may not need them. <laughs> Actually, th this is if, if you don't have an anthropomorphic alien, it's really hard to to represent them, isn't it? In a in a visual medium, unless they take over a human or something, and then that's your solution. But uh, the blob was quite. I good, guess actually. the blob, or what was that one recent one? The I think it was Denis Villeneuve uh, with the Amy Adams. Oh or, yes, yes, the amorphous smoke monster um, thing. Yeah, the kind of um, mm. whatever that was. I, I th that film was was very interesting and atmospheric, but I just remember feeling like, wow, this took a long time to sort of get that idea across, and. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just I, maybe my sort of tolerance level for art house is sort of diminished slightly because I I want to get to the meat of it, and uh, you know, and hours and hours of listening to ambient music and seeing things hover and smoke patterns is sort of like I just I just need something for my brain. Mm. <laughs> Who is the biggest cheapskate in uh your life? So, so I went a different way. I thought, uh, what if it's so? If it's a recently arrived in area, let's go with recently constructed. So it's an AI that's been brought in to make things more efficient. Ah, uh, okay, that's great. So, what are the things that a computer would immediately cut out without any sort of human weakness mm. or manipulation that could be brought upon it, and the ways in which people would try to manipulate that? Mm -hmm. So human cost cutting, I mean, human emotion is pretty unimportant, right? That's uh... <clears throat> actually uh, AI well, is no, it's AI... very important when you want to buy something. It's very important that you're triggering the correct ones. Oh, I see. Yeah, Trigger, it's trigger, critical trigger. to consumption. Hmm. You say trigger, 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 correct, correct consumption. No, I was just thinking about how. AI is usually depicted as this very, very rational, uber rational, and very cold emotionally. And I just was trying to imagine a very emotional AI that did everything through sort of mass data, but through intuition and impulsive and all that kind of thing. And what that would be like is having an emotional robot. Well, didn't we have that in Hitchhiker's Guide? The robot was always very depressed. Um, Quite down. Yeah, very down. Yeah. But one who was really amped up and excited all the time would be <laughs> kind of a, an amusing sidekick. All right, so I've got, I've got this. I kind of like the AI. So we, this is sort of like alien invasion, but the AI it's wants like, to think, I there, was, there was a point in my life where I, I'd, I'd sort of I'd hit a brick wall professional-wise, and I thought what I need to do is create a job that nobody else on Earth does yet because then – there's no one else you're competing with. You've created a whole new field. And the field I thought was AI psychotherapy. <laughs> Meaning you're give, giving robots psychotherapy or you're using AI? Uh, I think you'd have to say AI specifically. But yes, you could also go into robot behavior. Um, and the idea was what are the potential problems that could emerge in the future once these things are smart enough to develop problems? Well, and that way, you, you, no one can argue with you because it's entirely futuristic. Well, you, if you are giving AI, if you are a psychiatrist that's helping AI to function better, that is, mm -hmm. that seems like a job that would be very real in the far flung future, mm -hmm. or maybe not so far flung. Yeah. But, but what, what I thought was kind of funny when you said that is um, here in the US. You know, we've been trialing this teledoc service, which is you, you can't go in to see a doctor, so let's do it over telemedicine. And somehow the idea of doing it on the cheap sort of really hits home here because people are just finding it's really difficult to go to the doctor virtually. Um, and, it, and you talk about lag and lack of connectivity and whatnot. It's just a miserable experience for many people. So I can see this as sort of being a more efficient form of you know, AI psychotherapy on Teladoc, where you have to call in and, and talk to um, an AI system about your problems and it has to um, help you, which it would probably do in a very efficient manner. All right, we've got a couple of, the, the, the character here is something to do with 
AI or a person who uh, works with AI. So that that's kind of interesting. Let's just see if we get any complications that come out of any of these copper cards here. So let's try one at a time, I guess. So the first copper card is very, whoops, why can't I do this? It's uh, everything is backwards. Don't you love that? It's, it's like a brain tease. Um, motorcycle. So I don't know. Motorcycle. That doesn't seem like a complication. It seems like an object. So what do we do with motorcycle cheapskate AI? It's, well, for the alien, it's easy. The, the AI is because it feels like two different kind of notions. One sort of satirical yeah, and yeah. the other one's potentially more uh, dramatic. It's easy with, I mean, the alien, like, uh, that just seems easy to kind of, that's some choice they make. It's like the motorcycle is cheaper to use to get around or something. They don't have a spaceship um, in the motorcycle. Do yeah. they want motorcycles? We're the only place in the universe that makes motorcycles. And yeah. because they've been listening in on all our stuff, they've just hit Easy Rider. And so everybody wants motorcycles. Oh, wow. <laughs> or Hell's Angels. You can imagine the aliens together with Hell's Angels. Yeah, and they're all, they're all, they all, they yeah. all want leather jackets. They all want they all want leather jackets. They want daddy o. They're all using these sort of 60s um, phrases. And they all think that's exactly what Earth is going to be like. And it's not. So they show up as this motorcycle gang. Oh wow! So we've got we've got Alien meets Easy Rider. Uh, this is this is shaping up nicely now. So, <laughs> actually, I like the idea of Hell's Angels having an actual angel, sort of like an alien who is from outer space, and and they're all riding around in the bike club, and they're learning new skills like how to gouge eyes out of their sockets and stuff like this, and it's just really exciting, and they're they're re raising hell. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to okay. add another plot complication of some kind. Oh, this is really okay. not very helpful. This is, uh, again, yeah. it's all backwards. It's a wig. Wig. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, I guess the alien would wear a wig, wouldn't they? Because they look a bit strange without trying to be somewhat human. So a Rastafarian, they find a dreadlock, dreadlocks wig somewhere, and it's just... I mean, it, it's sorry, are the complications meant to be for, for the plot, or are they meant to be for the character? I, so, I think it's up to us. We can, we can make do whatever sense we for, for the character. But then it's okay. Th this is a cheapskate who has a wig. Mm -hmm. Or this they. Is, or it's they, interesting. If, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say it feels like uh, like uh, improv game prompts or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is. You know what this I mean? Like, like okay, tabletop improv. Blah 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 blah. Go. What do we What do we do with the wig? Does he work in a wig? Yeah. Does he live in a wig store? Does he wear a wig? Um, are wigs something that he's in, in love with? Like they're sexual? Except, like he sees a wig? And... Except they're unfunny cues. So do you think this is for an improv tragedy troupe? <laughs> or just... <laughs> uh, wigs are kind of depressing. They're basically dead hair. But, they're, but they open gateways to the bald to be not bald. So mm -hmm. they're, they're joyous things. I... I actually find that phrase you said rather enlightening, gateways to the bald. So somehow Easy Rider, Alien Easy Rider and Gateways to the Bald, uh, those have to be brought together. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I, all right, I'm gonna move us along. Let's try another one. I mean, that was, that was, I think the Easy Rider Alien is an interesting concept. I also like the sort of AI psychotherapy. Um, robots. I like need, the cheap fake need. alien invasion being done on the cheek because they think we're easy picking. <laughs> it's well. Oh, I mean, it's, get all I like yeah. the I, I like the idea of Mars attacks, but the aliens are really frugal and cheap. Yeah, and it's just they can't do anything in a big way. It always has to be very, uh, very inexpensive. <laughs> it, it took them so much just to get them to Earth in the first place, and now they're there. They've sort of run out of all their resources. Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to try another character. Oh, you know what we could do? Actually, we could do this. Well, let's do this one more time, and we could try one of the other little exercises they have. All right. Okay, we got a firefighter. Okay. Someone who fights fire. Maybe they breathe it. Maybe they douse it. Maybe they do something else with fire. 
And then we have person in professional disgrace. Mm hmm. A person in a professional disgrace. So they've been, what, fired? Um, sorry for that. Um, uh, who's, been, who's been in professional disgrace? Politicians have been in professional disgrace recently. Um, priests seem perennially, uh, Catholic priests in professional disgrace, um, sadly, but that's sort of indicative of systemic issues, which we are talking a lot about lately. So that's kind of topical, systemic racism. So is a defrocked priest who's become a firefighter. Okay. Or, or are we saying he's he's he screwed up in the last big fire thing, so he's been fired as a fire guy. Fired as the fire guy. I got defrocked fire eater. Now he's, that, a, he's a loner. His entire fire station one two one is turned against him. Now he's got to he he's to go back to that arson place and and find the clues that will clear his name. Actually, He's if, a you firefighter are, name. if you were a firefighter who set a fire and created arson, you'd be in professional disgrace. So that's a very simple, straightforward uh, concept there. Yeah, why would you? Or would you be that? incredibly successful? Oh, I mean, yes, the, if they found you, I'm the you'd greatest be the best arsonist, firefighter. Right, the greatest arsonist ever. So you start a fire and then you know exactly how to put it out. This is for your professional. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So you are, um, let's see, professional. <laughs> the arson side of you is really pissed off with you. Maybe it's split personality. One no. personality is an arsonist, the other is a firefighter. That could be a problem if you're a firefighter it's and a you're Jekyll setting and, fires. Jekyll and Hyde retelling. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Jekyll and Hyde. I'm trying to find, you know, think, trying to think non literally about a firefighter, but it's. Really okay, tough well, I mean, a firefighter would be anyone who puts out things that are blazing. So it could be a troubleshooter mm. for yeah, business, like for. Trump Journalism. Trump's chief of staff, or like it's like something like that. Mm -hmm. Trump's social media assistant. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, they're putting out the fires. So, God. Uh, oh, did you see? Did you guys see the unveiling, the 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 satirical unveiling of the new presidential portrait, and the guys have the oil painting with the dumpster fire on it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yes, putting out the dumpster <laughs> fire. Uh, that is that is our our political. So therefore, is that a, right? So if we're saying it's someone who is supposed to cover up things by being in professional disgrace, have they deliberately released something? Are they are they looking for a form of? I, I don't know forgiveness or or the public apology by releasing something that they've been holding on to for a while. Mm. My, my 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 humorous brain because you you said troubleshooter makes me think what is the most outrageous or unusual troubleshooter problem that you could think of that a person you know does as a vocation. Um, for example, the, the less bizarre, the more straightforward is someone who's in public relations, right? Because that's all they do is put out dumpster fires of various kinds. And so it could be a professional PR person who's for some reason experiencing some person, some professional disgrace. Maybe they've actually realized that they are the devil's spawn and now they've seen the light and they're going for the uh, public forgiveness apology by doing something correct, you know, instead of instead of supporting the, you know, the, remember the California raisins and all that kind of stuff, which were poisoning people instead of doing the PR campaigns to, to support the killing of children and stuff, you decide, well, I've really got to turn a new leaf and, and do something to help humanity. Um, this is like a, you know, um, like a, like somebody who really, you, you can't imagine getting public forgiveness or, or, uh, redemption who is goes on a, on, a, on a redemption, but they are somebody who is in uh, dumpster fire management. I mean, you could do a satire of contemporary politics by having it a period piece where the equivalent of a social media person attached to the Nazi party. 
who is constantly having to come up with ways to rephrase or restate the awfulness that's around them. Mm. Yeah, actually, I can imagine somebody who is born in some, some horrendously tight community like that, that there's a very singular way of thinking, but just thinks different. And it's there, you know, what do they do? They're you know, stuck in a situation where they're always a, an, a, the, the apologist. That's, that's the title, the apologist. All right, let's th throw in some copper cards and see what happens to this. So the first copper I mean, that, card, that in, yeah, go ahead. That it, that, or just generally that idea is interesting to me of the, 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 cause I think we're all apologists. Do you know what I mean? Like we're all apologists. Mm -hmm. We have to be like in order for their narrative selves to continue to function. We make, we do PR in our heads, you know, that I think, uh, mm -hmm. um, mm. just thinking of, um, I think it's Yuval Harari talks about like the CIA and the state department in our heads. Um, mm -hmm that are there to process information like in ways that allow us to continue to, to function um, uh, and live with ourselves and our notion of our own goodness that's kind of embedded or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that general idea of like the apologist, I don't know, I'm just stating that as a kind of like something I find interesting because I think it's mm -hmm. true of everyone. No, it's because uh, we're all negotiating the herd, right? All the time, the identity with the herd, like whatever the herd is, whatever herd we're part of. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is an experiment. Or imagine we're part. Of. There is an experiment mm -hmm. that was done that I read recently, where they wanted to um, identify because, like you were saying, they they theorize that there is some kind of uh, conscious, the stream of consciousness narrative that we use to connect ourselves with our version of reality so that we feel a uh, whole and as if we are a person and that stream of consciousness is doing what you're saying. It's sort of post rationalizing things. It's yeah. trying to make sense in, a, in, in, in real time all the time. And so they did experiments where they, I, I can't remember how they did exactly, but they did things to interfere with your yourself physically to make you go and do things that you had not thought of doing. So they had some way to trigger you to get up out of your seat for absolutely no reason or uh, things of this nature. And when they asked people why they were doing that, taking that behavior, they would always come up with an excuse. They'd say, well, because I need to go to the fridge or because I have to check my, my mailbox or whatever it was. So the point was the, the laboratory was doing the stimulus to cause the behavior and the brain was post they would generate why, why I was doing mm -hmm. this. Because, nothing, because for the human to feel mentally intact, they could not do anything without explanation. Um, yeah. everything had to have a place and and this was really interesting to me also because i remember that there have been you know the times in my life when i felt the most distressed or really lost was when i could not explain my own behavior when i had said or done something and i didn't know why or where it came from and so you know people are asking me what was the reason for that etc cetera, etc cetera, and i don't have an explanation and I imagine there, there is a reason, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And I found that just so perplexing um, and very destabilizing. So, yes, I think this is a really interesting thing to think about. The, the CIA and State Department mm. in our heads. And the, the, this, is a, this is the stream. It's a stream of consciousness, but it's very specific. So does our... Does our consciousness appear to the rest of our brain like a dictator? Mm. So you had that Disney movie where there were all those emotions. It was very clever, actually, about, mm. about a, a, a teen having to deal with all this stuff. But imagine one that's a satire of contemporary one state politics where the conscious appears like this awful dictator and all these other voices in the head are trying to explain why they're doing that and apologize for it. Now, this is Donald Trump is in my brain. Which he is at the moment. This is no, this, I can't this, this, the, this would be inside Donald Trump's brain. And there would be the one rational sub, 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 sub brain part that's desperately trying to come up with a narrative that explains his or her actions. I, I see inside his brain this little boy with like that shorts that are too small who is really timid and, and sort of, you know, asks questions occasionally but gets barked down by some, you know, sort of, Nazi like um, 
uh, a character. And so he's always being, you know, this, this little tiny id or something. Okay. Like so it's, how about this? Uh, is I, your first the I, think I think there's clear Sorry. evidence. I mean, this is just on Trump. Oh, there's Kitty's usual late meeting appearance. Um, uh, it's time. <laughs> Gentlemen, time, we have but, 10 minutes um, left, and that's that's the kitty giving yeah, 10 exactly. minutes, gentlemen, 10 minutes. Um, but I think there is actually, I mean, I, it seems clear to me, like, if you if you read any of the Alice Miller's work, very 90s kind of stuff, uh, for your own good and all those kinds of things, but she does analysis of, like, of uh, Hitler and dictators, and it's like, men like that, and I think Trump, clearly, uh, were, like, their fathers were fucking, like, abusive, fucking hateful uh, people like who abused them like i think it's like clear like it, he must have like grown up in an utterly tyrannical atmosphere which for me is kind of like the story actually is like it's all this person because because like mm. systemically like i don't know rumsfeld and cheney were pretty bad too but uh mm -hmm. you know at bush like <laughs> you know i know he was like like nicer on the surface or something but um you know what i mean like anyway mm -hmm. Well, I was going to concur That's with you and say tangential. No, no, I was adding that this idea that monsters are made. They don't come out of nowhere. Yeah. Right? Monsters these, are these... made. Like I think hmm. Yeah. And Sorry, and I also I think culturally we can contribute to this, you know, across the board. You know, right now we're, you know, the protests and demonstrations are dealing with these sort of deep-rooted issues and and so we can you know, as a society, we can make more monsters by encouraging narcissists and doing various other things. So, for example, I was thinking about how there's not everybody, granted, but a lot of people celebrate, you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, you know, all these people who are um, quite uh, sort of psychopathic and, and look upon that as the pinnacle of success. And that's what we want to emulate and that kind of thing. But these are not these are not people that you really want in your community. They're people that, that are constantly taking advantage of other people and finding ways to cheat the system and that type of thing. And so we can, as a, as a society, make these monsters too because we can hold them up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. um, so Absolutely. Yes. Society complicit. Society complicite. <laughs> I'll make it sound a bit French or something so it can be really... Okay. Uh, I can put our berets on for the next show. Yeah. And my god was. There's utterly, apropos of nothing, there's a really fantastic show um, by Complicité. I don't know if you know the, the English uh, kind of a quasi experimental performance online yes. called <laughs> The Encounter. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, that, really worth checking out. And that is the title of this jam, Apropos of Nothing. Apropos like of Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a great title. We have to use that. <laughs> um, so sorry. One more time. The link of the the, the complicite. It's complicite. Uh, it's on the complicite. If you just go the encounter, I saw it actually in Australia live, but it's really it works really well online too. Um, oh oh yes, this is it, the uh, the Amazon the, the sort of lost tribe. Simon and McBurney. Um, yeah, it's really yes. fantastic. It's really I, worth watching. I saw this. At, I didn't know it was online. I saw it in London live. Oh, you I, saw I it. You, they give you the headsets, right? Yeah, the he headphones. Does the, yeah, yeah. He does the 3D audio um, effects yeah. as he's doing the performance. Oh, that was really, that was something else. In fact, when it's I great. saw, when I, after I saw that show, I thought that is what we could try to do for virtual theater when we're all stuck at home, because that is a way to beam something into your brain that it, that uses virtual reality in a very clever way, because it doesn't require all the flash yeah. whiz bang of graphics, but just says we're going to put the audio in your head and you're going to imagine all these things. Uh, yeah. Although the live show had toured with, I saw it in Sydney, it, it toured with like 20 technicians or something like it, it was, it, mm -hmm. it was, and I mean, it's a lot of set, you know, it's a lot of visual yeah. stuff as well, yeah. but it was, it was a complex, but yes, absolutely. I a hundred percent agree but, with that. But like also a one man show. So, I mean, it is something that you can yeah. have this team of, of technicians and then one, one or just a handful of performers, and then people can at home use very simple yeah. technology to 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 experience that. I think I think we should I think we should work on it. Let's trademark this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do the the virtual okay. theater the virtual theater. Yeah, trip, we could so. we could call it radio. Three <gasps> D <3D> radio. Three <laughs> D radio killed the 
the uh, podcast. Go. Yes. <laughs> so we're we're going to uh, we're going to, to TM that. I'm sorry, everybody. That's that's TM now. Just because I say yep. so, because I am the TM dictator. All right, we got five right. minutes. I'm going to throw a complication. Oh my God, look at that! It it is that song is on the radio again. <laughs> this is almost almost as if it was chosen on purpose. So that song is on the radio again. The let's see, the apologist Jekyll and Hyde. What do we got? Dictators. What song? What song? You know, I heard a song this morning. I heard a song this morning that I hadn't heard in a while. It was, um, you know, CC and the Music Factory. Do you remember that band in the 80s? Yeah. Uh, Things that make you go hmm. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, that song, a DJ in his 30s played that song this morning. And I thought, wow. Um, the past is coming back to haunt us. We are gentlemen. We are that old. <laughs> we are. There's no that, question about that, it. That, that, that songs like that are, are kind of hip to put into musical mixes. Um, wow. All right. Well, I don't know what we do with that song is on the radio again. Maybe that's the heading of our next meetup. The song, that song is on the radio again. It's the three of us grappling with some. Will people some ever be stuff. nostalgic? Will people ever be nostalgic for the time we find ourselves in now? Yes. Wow. That is a great question. Because the nostalgia is, no, it is a great question. The, the nostalgia is, mm. yeah, it's so interesting. Because the nostalgia is, I mean, I have 20 or, you know, 20, 25 year old kids. Like the, the nostalgia is not about politics or, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the nostalgia is about culture. Mm. In fact, um, this is a really, this is a really deeper question. This is great for an issue. I, I just wrote down, what if nostalgia is lost due to the internet? Because there's no room for nostalgia mm. when everything is sort of ever present. You can't take a memory and sort of dress it up, put it in the past and then reminisce about it and aggrandize it or do any of those things that we do with old memories. Because nostalgia is always something that never quite existed. Isn't it? Mm. If you actually have the physical thing in front of you, it's always not as good as you remember it. So the, the so the fact that the internet presents us with, in fact, life just now that we can record everything about our lives, you, even on Google Street Maps, you can go back to about ten years ago and see what your street looked like ten years ago, or the shops looked like ten years ago. So is nostalgia actually never going to be a thing again? Because the thing could always be right there in front of you that you wanted. Yeah, I, I think I this is going to not be nostalgia because I said this very same story on on air, possibly with you guys. So excuse me if I'm repeating myself and all the, the past recordings are there to prove it, that I am losing my mind. But but this this reminds me of uh, how um, for years I used to tell people my favorite scene from Life of Brian. And uh, and of course, you know, I'd slightly embellish it. And it was it, it was it was it, I thought it was so funny. And when I finally saw Brian again. A uh, decade, you know, a couple of decades later, I realized the scene was not in the movie. So it, it, this was a, a very kind of painful experience. And now I've even forgotten what the scene was because I was so traumatized by the fact that my favorite scene was just completely made up in my head. But that's what nostalgia does, as you were saying. You you craft you craft a narrative of the past that that suits you, and it's a good feeling mm. because you can do it with other people. It doesn't have to be just you. You can get together with friends and craft a, a version of the past that feels good and not be confronted with the absolute reality of what happened. And now, no, nah, sorry, it's all there. Internet's got it, you know, been there, done that. You know, we know what happened. No, that's not what happened. I got, I got, I got, I love that. And I have to roll. I'm going to take off. All right, man. Nice to see you guys. Nice to Thank see you guys. Yeah, see you guys nice soon. To see you <laughs> take care. Okay. Ciao. Bye-bye. Take care.